Chapter 7, Chemical Bonding. There are three types of bonds that occur between atoms. Uh, depending on whether the atom is a metal atom or a non-metal atom, uh, there are different types of bonds. So when a metal and a non-metal become bonded together, we call that type of bond an ionic bond. And what's characteristic of that type is that electrons are transferred from one atom to the other, generally from the metal to the non-metal. Uh, when two nonmetal atoms are close to each other, they too can become bonded, can become stuck together. And we call that kind of bond a covalent bond. And generally, in this kind of bond, the electrons are shared between the nonmetals. And finally, when two metal atoms are close to each other, they too can be bonded together, and we call that a metallic bond. And what's characteristic of a metallic bond is that not only are the electrons being shared between the two metals that are directly next to each other, but uh, those electrons are also being shared amongst all of the metal atoms within the entire sample. So um, electrons being shared in the case of a covalent bond is generally just between the two atoms that are directly bonded. But in the case of a metallic bond with two metals, those electrons are shared between every metal atom in the entire sample. Ionic bonds have a characteristic shape uh, that's different from covalent solids or metallic solids. And we can see here that a uh, crystal of sodium chloride, for example, table salt, has sodium cations that are surrounded by chloride ions and chloride anions that are surrounded by positive sodium cations. So every positive is surrounded by negatives and every negative is surrounded by positives. Uh, that creates this kind of repeating crystal lattice structure that is uh, characteristic of ionic solids. Um, alternatively, when we have a covalent solid, you can see that here we don't have a, a lattice of repeating atoms. We have um, a lattice, rather, of repeating molecules. So you can see that the red atom represents oxygen, and these gray ones represent hydrogen. So this is H2O. Here's a water molecule. And in a crystal of ice, these water molecules are arranged in a regular repeating structure. So. Um, whereas we can't necessarily isolate a sodium chloride molecule in this structure, it's just atoms surrounded by other atoms. When we look here, we can see the H2O molecules. Here's one, and here's one, and here's one, the distinct molecules. So covalent solids are different than ionic solids, and those two are different than metallic solids. Metallic solids have a similar structure to um, ionic solids in that all of the atoms are, are close together. Uh, we can't see any distinct molecules like we can in, in a covalent solid. Uh, but again, the electrons in a metallic solid are pooled together so that um, not only are the electrons between these two atoms shared, but the, the, the electrons that these two atoms brought into the solid are also shared amongst all of the atoms in the entire solid. Sometimes we call this a sea of electrons. This is what allows um, electrons to be conductive. When we think about individual atoms, um, we saw last term that atoms are just a collection of protons and neutrons and electrons. And depending on where the atom is on the periodic table, we can determine how many electrons it has. And so one way of representing the electrons around an individual atom is with a symbol that we call a Lewis dot structure. So in a Lewis dot structure, we use dots to represent the valence electrons around elements. Um, and so we have to remember that there are valence electrons as well as core electrons. So oxygen is the eighth element on the periodic table. Two of the electrons on oxygen are core electrons. They're in uh, they're underneath in the first shell, and six of the electrons are outside in the second shell, in the outermost shell. So there are six valence electrons on oxygen. One, two, three, four, five, six. So we put the, um, the symbol representing the element in the middle, oxygen in this case, capital O, surrounded by six dots that represent the six valence electrons of oxygen. Here are the Lewis dot structures for um, all the all ten elements that are in the second row of the periodic table. So um, lithium is the first in the first column, 
So being the first element in that row, it only has one valence electron, so we would draw one dot. Beryllium has two valence electrons, two individual dots. Boron has three, carbon has four, nitrogen five, and so on. So here are the rules for drawing these symbols. So first we have to know how many valence electrons the element has. So we locate the element in the periodic table and uh, count from the beginning of that row from left to right. And once we know the position, then we know how many valence electrons it has. Write the chemical symbol of that element, B for boron, C for carbon, and so on. And then we place the valence electrons one at a time around all four corners. So for carbon, for example, we'd go one, two, three, four. It doesn't matter if I start at the left or the right or the top or the bottom. As long as there's four electrons, one at each corner, then I can place them any, any way I want. Um, once I've placed four electrons, if there are more, let's uh, look at nitrogen, for example. I would go one, two, three, four, and then nitrogen has five valence electrons. So when I place that fifth, now I'm going to start pairing it up with the electrons that are already there. So for nitrogen, I would draw the N, and I would draw one, two, three, four. Draw the first four at each of four corners, and then if there are any left over, like there are for nitrogen, which has five, then I would draw the fifth. I would just pair it up with one of these four that I've already drawn. Again, it doesn't matter if I draw that fifth one, drew it there on the right to pair it up with that one, but I could have drawn it over here on the left. And I also could have drawn it uh, on the top here, drawn the fifth one up on the top. It doesn't matter where the electrons go, on the top or the bottom or the left or the right, it just matters how many there are, and it matters whether they're single electrons or whether they're pairs. So for example, when I have four electrons, they're all single. One, two, three, four. When I have five electrons, there's three single electrons in a pair. One, two, three, four, and then I pair one up. And then when I get another electron, I have two pairs. And when I get another electron, I have three pairs. And when I get another electron, I have four pairs. So there are eight electrons that fit around the atom but they go in one at a time, and I get four single electrons first, and then I get four pairs as they pair up to give me eight electrons total. So most atoms can only hold eight electrons. We call this the octet rule. Uh, so a lot of the atoms that we'll be looking at, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, um, fluorine, most of the elements in the second row of the periodic table, they can only have eight electrons in their valence shell. But there are exceptions to this octet rule. In fact, there are lots of exceptions. So um, the elements that, are, that have fewer electrons than carbon, hydrogen, lithium, beryllium, and boron, they generally don't have eight electrons in their outer shell. Hydrogen can only hold two. Um, and uh, lithium generally rather than gaining seven since it only has one valence electron uh, to get eight it would have to gain seven so lithium generally loses that one valence electron and it looks a bit more like hydrogen or helium than like the elements that come later um, and beryllium and boron they generally have um, either four electrons or six electrons in their outer shell um, so two, two, four, and six before we get to eight electrons, these elements that are smaller, they can't hold eight because they're too small. Um, and finally, we have elements that have more than eight that are bigger than carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine. So any of the elements that are in the third period or below, like sulfur or phosphorus and any of those that are bigger, um, they can have more than eight el electrons in their outer shell. So the first thing we're going to look at is um, whether a bond is ionic or covalent. So to determine whether a bond is ionic or covalent, we just have to determine whether it's a metal or a nonmetal. So remember, when you look at the periodic table, there is a zigzag line. Uh, the periodic table looks kind of like this, right? And there's a zigzag line right here. 
that separates the metals from the nonmetals. So over here are nonmetals, and on the, this side of the line, on the left side of the line, these are the metals. So if we can identify whether an element is a metal or a nonmetal, then we can identify whether those two atoms are stuck together with an ionic bond or whether they're stuck together with a covalent bond. Metal plus nonmetal or nonmetal plus nonmetal. And of course there's that third option too, metal plus metal. But now we're, we're, gonna, we're not really going to look at metallic bonds, metal plus metal. We're only going to focus on ionic and covalent. So for example, KCl, if I saw this formula, I would identify K as a metal, it's right over here, and I would identify Cl as a nonmetal, it's right over here, Cl. Um, H2O, H, even though it's on this side, H is a nonmetal, it kind of belongs with those guys. So H, and there's an O right over here, so those are both nonmetals, so nonmetal plus nonmetal, that's a covalent bond. So when um, we have identified the elements as either cat I, um, as metals or non-metals, then um, when they come together, they're going to make an ionic bond. In that ionic bond, I always have a cation, which is positive, and an anion, which is negative. So all ionic bonds have a plus and a minus. So remember, the positive ion is called a cation. The one that becomes the cation is always the metal. The metal becomes a cation. The metal loses an electron and becomes a cation. The nonmetal in an ionic bond, it's always going to gain an electron and become an anion. So when I see a, a formula, KCl, is it ionic or covalent? Well, I see K, and I know that that's a metal. And Cl is a nonmetal. So metal plus nonmetal. I know that this is ionic. Okay, so if this is an ionic bond, I know that ionic bond is a plus and a minus. That's what ionic means. So which one is the plus and which one is the minus? Well, the metal is always going to be the cation, and the nonmetal is always going to be the anion. And the metal is always going to come first. So if there is a metal in a chemical formula, it is always the first element in the formula. Metals are always first. So remember, plus and minus are attracted like magnets. Plus and minus get stuck together. That's the bond. The cation and the anion are stuck together like magnets. Plus and plus repel. Minus and minus repel. Similar charges repel each other. Opposite charges attract. So how did these ions form? Remember that all of the elements on the periodic table we assume are neutral. A sodium atom has 11 protons and it has 11 electrons. So 11 plus 11 means that sodium is neutral. So how does sodium, which is a metal, become a cation? Well, sodium has 11 electrons, and chlorine has 17. Chlorine has 7 electrons, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 in its outer shell. So remember, the octet rule says that elements want to get 8 electrons in their outer shell. So chlorine only needs one more to have 8. Nitrogen has one electron in its outer shell, so nitrogen needs seven more electrons to get to eight. Or, if, if sodium loses this one electron, then it would have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. It would have eight electrons underneath. It has a full shell of eight underneath this one. So, sodium has one extra it wants to get rid of. Chlorine needs one more that it wants to take to get to eight. So when sodium and chlorine come together, the sodium gives its one electron to chlorine. Now it has eight underneath, and chlorine has eight in its shell. When sodium loses its one electron, it becomes plus, and when chlorine gains one electron, it becomes minus. Then plus and minus get stuck together like magnets. So now these are stuck together.
Over here, a sodium atom and a chlorine atom are not sticky together. This is neutral and this is neutral. They're not sticky at all. But after this electron transfer happens, then I have a positive particle and a negative particle. Now they are sticky. So the plus and the minus stick together. That's an ionic bond. Another way to represent that is just by drawing the Lewis structures. K has electrons underneath, which we see here. We can see the electrons underneath. But sodium also just has one valence electron. So I can represent that like this. K, potassium, has one valence electron. So I'll just draw one dot there. I only draw valence electrons when I draw Lewis structures. Chlorine has lots of electrons underneath, right? It has 17 total electrons but only one, two, three, four, five, six, seven in its outer shell. So I only draw one, two, three, four, five, six, seven in the Lewis structure. So potassium plus chlorine, the potassium loses an electron to chlorine, and I get K plus, a cation, and Cl minus, an anion, and they stick together, and that's an ionic bond. So determine whether the bonding in each of these compounds is ionic or covalent. All right, here's a periodic table. Our line that separates metals from nonmetals is right here. So remember, the nonmetals are on this side, and the metals are on this side. OK, so lithium fluoride. Lithium is right here. So lithium is a metal, M. Fluorine, over here. Fluorine is a nonmetal, N, M. So metal plus nonmetal, this is ionic. All right, sulfur, S. S is right here, nonmetal. Chlorine, right here. Chlorine is a nonmetal. S and Cl are both nonmetals, N, M, N, M. This is covalent. All right, calcium is right here, metal. Nitrogen is over here on this side, non-metal. That is ionic. Copper, well, we know copper is a metal. That's right here. Sulfur, again, non-metal. So this is ionic, metal plus non-metal. Xe, xenon. Xenon is over here. It's a noble gas, so it's a non-metal. F, fluorine, non-metal. Nm, non-metal, non-metal. This is a covalent bond. C, carbon, non-metal. Oxygen, non-metal. Another covalent bond. And barium, BA, is right here. Barium is a metal. Sulfur, over here, nonmetal. O, oxygen, nonmetal. So look at this. This compound has three. So we've got metal, nonmetal, nonmetal. We didn't talk about this. We've only talked about non metal plus nonmetal, ionic. Nonmetal plus nonmetal, covalent. So what do we have here? Metal plus nonmetal. Well, this bond between those atoms, this is ionic, metal plus nonmetal. But here I have nonmetal and nonmetal. So that means that this bond between these nonmetals is covalent. So this compound has both ionic bonds and covalent bonds. Covalent bonds between the nonmetals, sulfur and oxygen, just like sulfur and chlorine up here, nonmetals, covalent. Nonmetals, covalent. But metal, nonmetal, this is ionic. Metal, nonmetal with sulfur, this is an ionic bond. So this compound has both kinds of bonds, ionic and covalent. In fact, that's always going to be true if there are th three 
or more elements. Okay, let's draw a Lewis structure for the following compound, MGBr. So, what kind of bonding is in MGBr? Mg is right here, metal. Oops. Mg is right here, metal. Br is right over here, non-metal. So we've got metal, non-metal. This is an ionic bond. So what does this structure look like? Magnesium is right here. So how many valence electrons does magnesium have? Well, we go to the beginning of the row, row three, and we count from left to right. One, two. So magnesium has two valence electrons. Now we have bromine. And we have two of these bromine atoms. So I'll draw another one over here. And how many valence electrons does bromine have? Here's bromine. Bromine has one, two, and we're going to skip the transition metals, so skip all these pink ones. So one, two, skip, three, four, five, six, seven. So I know that the uh, noble gases, seven, eight, always have eight. So look, I have, well, except for helium, which has two. One, two. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, neon. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, argon. This is where the octet rule comes from. Neon and argon are, are noble gases. They want eight electrons in their noble shell, in their valence shell, that makes them very stable. Um, so here are two. One, two, skip these. Three, four, five, six, seven, eight. One, two, skip these. Three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So why do we skip these? Well, we'll talk about that more late, later. So for now, let's just skip them and realize that, except for helium, all of the noble gases have eight in their outer shell, which means that all of these have seven, all of these have six, all of these have five, all of these have four, all of these have three. All right, so bromine has seven. One, two, three, four. We draw them one at a time first, and then we pair them up. Five, six, seven. One, two, three, four, five six, seven. Okay, so remember these atoms as is, these don't have any attraction. This is neutral, neutral, neutral. These atoms are like, like pool balls. They just bounce off of each other. They're not like magnets. They have no attraction to each other. So in order to make an ionic bond, I need pluses and minuses. Right now I don't have any pluses and minuses. I've just drawn atoms. But we saw this situation before. Bromine has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. It's right here. It wants to have eight. It wants to be just like krypton. This bromine has seven. It wants to have eight. Magnesium is right here. It wants to have eight. But magnesium is not going to get one, two, three, four, five, six more. But magnesium can lose one and go backwards, 2, because magnesium is 12, so if I lose 2, I go 1, 2, and go back to neon, so then it has 8 underneath. So what happens here, how do I get these ions when I have neutral atoms? Well, the same thing that we did before. This electron goes right here, so then bromine, that bromine has 8. This electron goes here, so then that bromine has 8. And what do we get after that? Well, we get Br... One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, minus Br. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, minus. Br. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, minus. 
that gets a negative charge because it got an extra electron, they both do, and magnesium here in the middle, it lost two electrons. So what happens to it? It gets a positive charge for losing one electron. It gets two positive charges for losing two electrons. So this is a good representation of MgBr2, a Lewis structure. Just like we had drawn NaCl before, well, if I can draw the Lewis structure, I know how many valence electrons each atom has, then I can figure out how they're going to stick together when they come together to make a compound like magnesium bromide.